Uh, well, I'm going to give you a quick update on why we, what the benefit, I mean, some of you, we already talked over it, some of you guys already mentioned why tunnels are better and the advantages we'll have, fragmentation, so on, uh, no fragmentation and so on. I'm going to talk about why and go over some of the points and then we can also discuss are we an overlay or not. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Um, most SD-WAN solutions you see today, uh, not from us, from any of our competitors, you'll see they use IPsec tunnels plus some sort of tagging mechanism because they also need to aggregate things into tunnels and be able to separate them out again. So some sort of VLAN tag or VXLAN tag plus IPsec and GRE header. That obviously adds a lot of bytes to the packet. Um, having said that, how much depends on the size of the packets. Uh, if they're voice packets, you're adding almost 100% overhead. If they're jumbo frames, if they're 1500 byte packets, then maybe 10%, 15%. If they're IMIX style packets, maybe 30 to 40%, depending on the type of packet you have. I just wanted to show the, the comparison. If you have tunnel mode and if you have transport mode for IPsec, uh, the original packet size, obviously, uh, it depends on what the packet size is. That remains the same, plus you add all of these overhead bytes. In our case, we only nat the packet. So we're only natting the IP header. We do not add these full headers um, in case of our, our scenario. We don't encapsulate the packet, which is basically we don't add a full IP header per packet. That is what leads to the bandwidth savings. Um, let's look at how much will be the bandwidth savings. Uh, someone's going to show a live demo later on to compare. We'll send the same stream over, over, over 128T and SVR, and we'll do a comparison. But this is something what it looks like, the comparison. If you compare it, um, this is the comparison of SVR versus IPsec for the same traffic being sent over um, and received. In case of IPsec, we see there is, in case of SVR, we see there is no overhead. Uh, we do not add any overhead to the packets. In case of IPsec, you'll see there is a 40% overhead. These, if for this case, we are using IMIX packets with, and the encrypted flows uh, with authentication turned on. Um, so that's the difference. Of course, the advantage of bandwidth savings, you get superior performance over low bandwidth links. When there's low bandwidth links, obviously there's going to be some congestion. Your applications are going to automatically start performing better when you remove 30 to 40 percent overhead and you, you, you provide that to the payload. We're going to prevent fragmentation MTU issues. I'm going to talk about it in the next slide. And of course, compared to any IPsec plus VXLAN based scheme, you'll see a 30 to 40 percent um, saving in bandwidth immediately over any, any other, when you, when you compare them side by side. In-band signaling, obviously, we're using the in, in the metadata. The, you already heard about it, how we use the first packet processing and the metadata in the first packet. That reduces a lot of control traffic. And obviously, we have noticed, depends on the depends on the scenario, obviously, there's no hard and fast way to measure user experience and how much improvement you see for an application. But having said that, over in some cases, this is actually for a, from, a, from a customer deployment we have for oil and gas. They said they're seeing a 7x improvement just by switching over from tunnel-based to tunnel-free because of the improvement in congestion. Um, fragmentation. Fragmentation causes a lot of issues in the network. Um, we, obviously, we already spoke about how we can prevent, you know, we do fragmentation in service-based fra fragmentation in the fabric. We don't uh, do it in the stream. Um, having said that, because we are not adding packets, uh, not adding any overhead, most of the time packets will not be fragmented in our case, um, traditional IP packets. In case of traditional IP packets, let's look at what would happen. Uh, you are obviously increasing the transmission time when you fragment packets because now you have to, you have to add IP headers and you're, of course, spacing them out. Um, Usually, reassembly is inefficient on routers. The reason being, you need to, you do not know how many fragments you're going to get. So what you do is every time you get a fragment, you assign the biggest possible buffer, memory buffer to the, to the packet to able to buffer everything. And of course, then you receive packets, you, you, know, you, you ultimately form the packet back. If you lose any packet in, the, in a sequence, you need to resend all the packets. There's no concept of sending only the fragment out of band. Um, you need to resend everything. If you receive things out of sequence, for example, if you receive packet number two first, if you have a firewall in the middle, it's going to drop your packet because it thinks this is a malformed packet. This is, it hasn't, he has not seen fragment number one. So anytime there is a jitter and you, and you receive things out of sequence, you will lose, you'll have to resend the entire, uh, entire, entire thing again. Fragmentation after encapsulation negates speed gain. Any speed gain you get from, get from hardware, um, from the hardware you, you program and the hardware forwarding you do, every time you fragment and after that you encapsulate traffic, obviously you, you lose the hardware gain you got because now you've got to take them off the, off the buffer. Um, having said that, these are not stuff we have only thought about. 
There's an RFC on it, RFC 44, 56, 59. You can go read it in more detail, but that actually states all of these as being problems from tunnels. Um, oh. Of course, this was before we, we made session-based routing, so no one's written anything about session-based routing, but having said that, there is an RFC which says tunnels are bad. Um, why do tunnels cause poor scale? We, I just spoke about it before, that it's an n-square problem. You can't have a full mesh of 1,000 times 1,000 tunnels per branch router. I mean, of course, you can, but then you have to have humongous routers. The reason is because of the virtual tunnel interface you need to maintain. Think of, let's go over the example. For example, let's say you want to send, uh, send packets from here, uh, from source to destination. You have two traditional routers, and they have an IPsec tunnel. What happens when a packet comes in? It's going to come in. It's going to hit your inside interface. You're going to set it into the forwarding engine, which is then going to do a lookup. It's going to create a virtual tunnel interface. It's going to do a lookup. It's going to encrypt the packet. It's going to send it back. It's going to do a lookup in the routing table, and then send the packet out. Uh, to the outside interface. Of course, the same thing happens on the other side when you send the packet out. Um, it's, it doesn't go faster. It goes the same way on the other side. But the idea is basically you'll have to do a lookup two times. You have to create a virtual tunnel interface. You send this out. This is why there is a low throughput and performance as soon as you enable tunnels in the, uh, in the, in the network. If you look at any of the, the third-party performance charts for any of the traditional routers, you'll see that they have um, you know, forwarding without tunnels, and then IPsec tunnels, and IPsec with QoS, and so on. All of these obviously reduce the performance, and you'll see there's a big hit when IPsec is enabled. Um, and that is why scale is poor. You can't have a full mesh of tunnels, which forces you to go hub and spoke. I'm going to talk about the design in, in a second. And of course, ultimately, this leads to poor experience. Uh, there's a lot of configuration involved. One of the disadvantages of having tunnels is that you need to have IP address configured, or configured here. You need to maintain these IP addresses. You could use DMVPN for creating tunnels on the fly, but then that in increases the complexity of the deployment, causes a lot of issues, and so on. Um, let's look at the designs with and without tunnels. Um, one way we, we talked about it already, the one easy way to avoid um, the tunnel complexity or the scale problem with tunnel is to go hub and spoke. Basically, you create hub sites um, in different parts of your network. You, you only tunnel to those hub sites. Obviously, this creates high latency. You're going to thrombone traffic. All traffic now has to go via the hub site. It creates inefficient pathways. And of course, the hub sites, because they, they still need to terminate these large number of tunnels, you need these routers to be much bigger than your traditional branch routers. So you are increasing the cost of the deployment. If I create a full mesh or if I create DMVPNs, then obviously this is what I'm ending up with. I'm doing point to point. But I can only do low scale in case of, if I, of a full mesh. In case of full mesh, I can't have so many tunnels because then each of these routers becomes humongous. So to avoid that, I, need to, um, I, need, I can't do a full mesh. It'll have low scale. But if the number of sites is low, it's possible to do a full, full mesh using <coughs> IPsec tunnels. Uh, but if, of course, if you use DMVPNs or anything to create tunnels on the fly, then complexity is high and it's difficult to manage. In our case, this is what a de deployment will look like. There is no mesh of tunnels. There is no, um, and there is no flows. Unless there is a flow, no, no, established, no logical connection is established. In this case, assume there is a service here. And if, you, if these routers want to send packets, then obviously the first packet goes through. A logical connection is established, and then flows go through as needed. It's an any-to-any -any connection uh, depending on when the connection is required. And that's why it creates the most efficient pathway. It has high performance. And obviously, it's easy to manage, because you don't have to go and configure anything. So you just configure where the services are located, and uh, flows are directed towards services as and when required. Um, so if you look at the benefits or disadvantages of each of them, um, hub and spoke, you're forced into this design with tunnels. Because you have tunnels, you're forced to do hub and spoke. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to do hub and spoke if, if you didn't need it. Uh, only small scale is possible with a full mesh. Otherwise, you have to go towards hub and spoke. In our case, um, tunnel setup times are too long if, if you do DMVPNs only. But in our case, if you do an any-to-any -any connection with in-band signaling, you obviously have um, unlimited scale. Uh, just to give a comparison, um, a traditional branch router of comparing to a four-core Intel Atom processor with a same similar price range <coughs> with a traditional ASIC-based router or any other router which has IPsec, 
It can do about a thousand IPsec tunnels. In us, in our case, we can do about five million sessions through each of these uh, these four core atom processors uh, at any point in time. So it's not just slight improvement in uh, in scale. It's actually a couple of thousand orders magnitude improvement in scale. If I were to make a comparison, but it's it's not fair because we are not using tunnels. Any questions on on the IPsec versus? It's pretty self-explanatory, yeah. Um, Failover is slow in case of IPsec tunnels. If I look at it, all backup tunnels need to be established at all times if I want to fail over immediately. One of the disadvantages of doing this, and some of the carriers have told us whom we work with, is that it locks an IP address from the LTE network all the time. The number of tunnels you have, that many IP addresses you lose from the IPsec network because you're creating this backup tunnel and sending pings and keeping that tunnel alive. And of course, you're paying for data for that. Um, the other option is you establish tunnels at runtime. Obviously, when you do that at runtime, you need to exchange keys. You need to establish, have the controller involved in, in establishing this connection. This leads to delays. In most cases, we have seen in a lab environment, people can probably show you a failover and show it works. Session doesn't get dropped. But whenever we see it in the network, in a, in a real setting, especially when, LT, when the LTE network is involved, it usually leads to a long setup time. And sessions drop during that time, especially voice calls drop. And it makes it difficult to. Uh, uh, to do an uh, instantaneous failover. Usually, you have to reestablish the connection. The other thing I wanted to talk about is security bypass. With Even though the next session is going to be security and how, IPsec, how uh, without IPsec and without this, we are doing a zero trust network, tunnels bypass security. Um, the reason for that is anytime you create a tunnel between two endpoints, you explicitly or implicitly uh, sort of establish a a trust between them. You assume that whatever you have bridged together is trusted. In our case, we of course do not do that. We of course authenticate each packet. In this, in this case, what happens is tunnels bypass network security and filtering because you're establishing a direct, it thinks that it's on the same LAN now. When you put the things in packets, it obscures what, what you see in the packet. It's very difficult to inspect and filter packets once they're tunneled because you're aggregating flows into a single tunnel. The, the usual answer given is you just copy the toss bits out for QoS, but that works for QoS and for saying you get eight classes, you can't do better than that. But you can't do a per session based inspection or filtering. You increase exposure due to NAT holes in public tunnels. And also because you have the IP addresses now, you can do some profiling and figure out from the tunnel addresses what is happening. Now, <laughs> I guess I'm going to call you out a little bit here, right? So you're doing the same thing. So when I say this, you're not in a tunnel, but you're obfuscating the traffic the same way. So you're saying your solution is secure because your devices do that, but your competitors do as well. They provide security in their solution. So I just, I'm, I'm seeing this and I'm kind of like, I appreciate what you're saying, as in you can't, you can't look at the traffic after it's exited into the tunnel and do anything with it, but you can't with yours either because it's encrypted. If you encrypt and it, I have, it. I don't have the source and destination IP. I don't have any of that information. So I, th this to me isn't a differentiator. Just, what, just what, being clear. So what? Um, let me let me re-explain that. Yeah. So for us, what happens is since each each um, each session is a hyper-segmented session in itself, we are not aggregated into traffic. You even though we are natting it, you have the ability. At least the 12080 routers have the ability to understand what is happening with each session individually. Right. But an SD WAN router, but an SD one of your competitors has the same ability because they see the traffic unencumbered. You're right. If, if the, the middle network sees it the same way, like us and like them, the yeah. only difference is this one in the middle network. In the middle network. Because you can see the inner IP address in a, in a the inner header in an IPsec tunnel, you actually get the you have the ability to profile and find out what's happening inside. It's not fully masquerading the traffic. In our case, we are natting it, so we completely remove uh, the IP addresses. Okay. Having said that, again, these are in RFC six one six nine. If you read it, it says, you know, how security bypass happens with tunnel. Uh, that is actually the RFP, um, RFC. Sorry. The RFC actually calls out these and some other things as, as problems related to security when you have uh, tunnels. Having said that, I just want to do a generic comparison before I hand it to, to Prashant. Um, in general, if you look at it, IPsec, scale is lower. Scale is in hundreds or thousands. In our case, scale is in millions of sessions. Um, you are forced to hub and spoke designs with IPsec <laughs> in case of tunnel-free routing, SVR, you have on-demand uh, creation of architecture. Um, tunnels, of course, have 30 to 50 percent overhead in traffic. In our case, we, of course, have zero overhead except for first packet. 
tunnels cause fragmentation, which leads to poor performance. Uh, in our case also, the first packet fragmentation is possible. We already talked about it. Uh, but other than that, of course, the remaining packets, it's possible they may still be fragmented if they anyway cross MTU size or if the MTU size is small. But in general, compared to an IPsec, we are not adding. So we should not cause fragmentation. Uh, we do, we do, tunnels, of course, require have a long setup time or require backup tunnels. In our case, failovers. I have a question on that point about fragmentation. Do you feedback uh, message too big that you receive in the underlay back to the uh, originator? Uh, you mean to the originator to adjust the MTUs? Uh, yeah, yeah. If, if in between uh, two waypoint addresses you in encounter a constrained link. So then we would take care of the fragmentation. That's how the, the service-based fragmentation works. Got it. Okay, so in that case too. That yes, but we would not inform the application to do anything different. We wouldn't do that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and finally, tunnels, of course, bypass security and cause some exposure and profiling. In our case, uh, hypersegmentation masquerades the network completely and provides security. Any uh, questions before I go to the overlay? Um, that's a more philosophical topic, but um, okay. Is SVR an overlay? Uh, depends how you look at it. Just like we said, you know, depends how you look at fragmentation. Whether we are fragmenting or the network is fragmenting, um, depends on how you look at it. In general, if I look at the definition of any overlay, overlay technology, overlay will say, overlays is commonly known as map and end cap. We do not do encapsulation, which is why we say we are not an overlay. We, are, we have a logical understanding between the two endpoints, which is true. That's what we did with our first packet. Is it possible that, that you can call that an overlay? It's up to you. But having said that, a proper definition of overlay says it's a map and end cap. We don't encap pa encapsulate packets. Um, if you look at any other, uh, that's the definition I took from the map and end cap from the RFC. If you look at any other uh, overlay technology, VXLAN, NVGRE, or IPsec, you know, even IPsec VPNs, uh, they all end cap packets or add some sort of header some sort of other header per packet to distinguish some label, some sort of VXLAN ID or something else. We do not do that per packet because we keep state in the router. We only do it for the first packet. That is why we say we are not an overlay, we are different. Um, having said that, all the benefits which overlays bring, like creating virtual networks, address separation, uh, mobility, decoupling of addresses, we do that as well with our uh, ability to keep session state and separate the endpoint IP addresses from the middle network. We do that as well. We, we bring all the other benefits of logical separation, virtual networks, and so on. We actually do overlay IP addresses. We actually do, uh, what do you say, decoupling and, and, and overlapping IP addresses much better than what you would be able to do with overlays. Uh, 